Over the last decade, VC money has been abundant, resulting in startup raising every 18 to 24 months at relatively rich valuations. However, it looks like the time of growing at all costs and the glory days of cheap money is now over. With the recent collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, the slowdown of the economy and layoff from big tech, venture investing and startup funding are entering a new era. Let's look at just two quick slides and some numbers that features this new environment that we're in. So on this slide, you can see that global VC funding has slowed down dramatically in Q1 this year. It reached 76 billion, which is over 50% decline compared to Q1 2022. If we take out the two largest deal in Q1, which is Stripe and OpenAI, the decline was even more dramatic, over 60%. And this decline happened across all stages from seed stage to late stage funding. On the next chart, we can observe that similar slowdown happened in deal counts. Deal counts have slowed down dramatically since Q3 2022, also across all funding stages. Despite a record high of dry powder that VC still have, that's almost 600 billion, venture investors have scaled back and slowed down in looking at new opportunities while looking at their current existing portfolio. So today we're very excited to have three leaders from venture, in, uh, venture investing industries to discuss where we're headed and the opportunities as well as challenges facing going forward. We have joined us today, we have Edis Young, general partner at Race Capital, Clinton Foy, general partner, venture capital at United Talent Agency and Fund, and Neil Devani, founder and managing partner of Necessary Ventures. So without further ado, let's get to it. I will start with you, Edis. Uh, you are based in Silicon Valley and in the middle of, of it all. Did you bank with Silicon Valley Bank? And how did the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank impact the VCs and their portfolio companies in the Valley? Thank you for having uh, all of us to be part of this discussion today. Uh, just to set a little bit of context, so Race Capital, uh, we actually just sort of launched our, um, our office on particular on March 9th, uh, the day that um, Silicon Valley Bank started to collapse with downtown Palo Alto. We focus on pre-seed seed, uh, all things infrastructure software. Um, a lot of developers' tools, open source, um, really focus on data, AI. And we also look at a lot of uh, crypto and Web3. And so as, SVB was a primary banking partner and it almost gave me a heart attack. And I felt like since March 9th, literally banking crisis, um, no pun intended, is everything is all happening all at once. It's not just SVB, the signature bank. Um, it was now you um, Credit Suisse. It was literally like everywhere. It seems like the banking infrastructure are really not in, in, in good shape. And on March 9th, we, on top of that, we were in the middle of closing our fund. Um, very, very thankful that we were able to pull 100% of our, our, of our funding out of SVB, but it was definitely not for the faint of hearted. SVB is a very, very special um, partner for us because not only they're a the primary banking partner for many, many funds in Silicon Valley, they're also limited partner for many very tier one fund um, in, in Silicon Valley. And they also um, provide a lot of venture debt for, for startups, not let alone many, many, at least one third of our portfolio companies actually bank with them. They're really the bedrock of venture capital and it's been around for four decades. So not having them around really change the way that we operate. Um, I remember like the weekend that happened before where we knew the FDIC is going to um, take over or, or they're going to, and now, of course, now they're part of uh, another bank. We really didn't know, like at least many of our companies wasn't even sure that they were able to make their payroll the next week. So it was definitely a very, very scary week. And we're still you know, looking at like how things are going to unfold for all of us. 
Thank you, Edith. Yeah, that sounds um, like quite a venture that you experienced. Um, and I will turn over to you, Clinton. You are based in Los Angeles and what we call Silicon Beach, and you are working with a Hollywood giant. So how was a large institution like UTA impacted by the collapse of SVB? Did you feel anything? Yeah, so it's a great question. And I think there's two answers. Um, you know, I'm general partner managing director at UTA VC, which is the venture arm and the venture capital fund that sits alongside United Talent Agency, which is one of the biggest agencies in the world. Um, UTA, we represent, you know, anything from like sports stars like LeBron James to um, entertainers and creators like Aquafina. And on the one hand, um, much like Edith, our UTA VC fund really felt an impact very quickly because some of our early portfolio companies, Bank with Silicon Valley Bank. I've been in the venture industry for the last 10, 12 years almost. And we banked with Silicon Valley Bank at UTA VC. Now, luckily, on the United Talent Agency side, we also had seven other relationships with major banks like JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citibank. And so we were able to very quickly, um, I think, diversify our funds, diversify our account, and get money out and diversify very quickly. And so it was a little less stressful, maybe, than if I was just, if it was our, our only sole relationship. But in the same way as Edith said, it really affected some of our portfolio companies. And also psychologically, it really created, I think, a chilling effect that I, I never thought in my lifetime I'd be around for a bank run. And it happened so fast across all social platforms and across text. And just driving by um, Brentwood Silicon Valley Bank, which is Brentwood's a very posh neighborhood right near Beverly Hills, and seeing people lined up out the door to try and get their deposits out was something that was very shocking to me. So the good news is this, is I think for our portfolio companies and I think for other seed funds and other venture capital funds, I think we've really learned the hard way how to diversify and how to institute best practices for treasury management, for cash management, and not to have all your eggs in one basket. Um, nobody thought Silicon Valley Bank was going to go down until it went down. So um, again, the good news, if there is any good news, is I think everyone's a little more cautious and also instituting best practices for what's going to happen going forward. And we don't know what's going to happen going forward, though. Yeah, thank you, Clinton. And I really like that you always look at the bright side, the lessons already learned, so that we can be more prepared for maybe even more future crisis. Um, now, uh, let me ask you the third question. So one of necessary ventures investment focus is FinTech and financial services. Do you actually see opportunity with the deficiency of the current banking system um, as opportunity for startup in FinTech? Yeah, yeah, um, we, we definitely do, absolutely. Um, uh, first, thanks, thanks for having me uh, and thanks to the Asia Society for having all of us here. Um, in terms of the opportunity for uh, startups in financial services, uh, I think that's been present long before uh, we were in the current environment, and we've seen lots of interesting innovation come from uh, the fintech sector. Uh, to understand how we think about it, I would share first a, a framework of how we think about financial services, which is in a, a three-layer stack. Your, your top layer is the front end for customer acquisition. Um, this is generally marketing, but you can also think about uh, Chase Bank having brick and mortar locations everywhere as a customer acquisition strategy that startups can't necessarily compete with. You could think about Square providing free hardware devices uh, or free peer-to-peer -peer transfers through Square Cash as a way to acquire customers in an innovative way. Um, that's the top layer. The, the middle layer in this three-layer stack is your operations, your risk. You can think about underwriting and insurance or lending or payment processing, uh, these kinds of services being in that middle operational layer. And then the bottom layer is basically your, your back end or your cost of capital. Um, what does it cost you to acquire capital that you can lend or hold uh, against your insurance? 
So uh, startups generally are very undermatched on that bottom layer on the back end. They they almost never have a lower cost of capital than an incumbent institution uh, because they don't have scale and they don't have generally the legal structure uh, that a uh, an incumbent institution has. So they have to find ways to compete on that middle layer or that top layer. And that's what we look for. And that's what we've seen in terms of where fintech companies can be successful. Um, the other option, of course, is to serve the incumbents with something better uh, that improves their, their operations. Um, as a quick example, uh, we invested in a company called Relief. Uh, we invested in their pre-seed. Uh, they provide free debt settlement services. Uh, so Relief is using technology in the middle layer to lower transaction costs by one to two orders of magnitude. Um, that allowed them to offer the services for free, which no one else has done before, which allowed them to lower the acquisition cost by one to two orders of magnitude, uh, which creates a new business model than the incumbents. Um, this, this allowed them to then catch the attention of folks like Ken Chenault and Vikram Pundit, who joined as follow-on investors and as the ex-CEOs of American Express and of Citigroup, um, they're, they're two of the top uh, top 10 unsecured consumer credit providers in America. Um, and so that's been helpful for us to now figure out how do we uh, also interface with the incumbents, with the existing institutions uh, that are providing credit and dealing with debt settlement. Um, so we, we see an opportunity not just to compete with the existing incumbent financial services by innovating in those top two layers, but also to partner with them depending on where they sit in the overall stack in the ecosystem. Thank you for sure, uh, Neil. Uh, talking about opportunity, actually, this is a good segue into my next question. Um, there is a character in Chinese that is, consists of uh, risk and opportunity. So we talk a lot about Silicon Valley Bank crisis already. I want to step back and ask this high level big picture question that is in, actually in the title of our discussion. So with the economic uh, slowing down, delay off, and the banking crisis still brewing. How do these changes uh, impact the landscape of venture investing? Going forward, do you see more opportunities or risk for venture investors? Um, I, I think it's it's a little bit of both, right? So uh, for the companies that have raised a lot of money uh, that are out there without the performance to match that, they're not in a tough spot so long as rates are staying high. Uh, and as the market is kind of uh, cold and slow, um, that's that's going to be painful. It's been something that a lot of companies and investors have found ways to keep putting off by uh, doing layoffs, by doing bridge rounds, avoiding down rounds, finding ways to avoid uh, running out of cash. Um, but but so many uh, companies are being written down, you know, 50, 60, even 80 percent right now from what we're seeing uh, on the secondary market. And so. Uh, to that effect, you know, LPs are also looking at that and thinking, you know, they're they're overexposed, or why would they put more money in uh, to get whatever IRR they're going to get when they could go uh, do private credit or something like that, uh, with with much less risk uh, and the same or even less illiquidity. Uh, so, you know, I think from that perspective, it's going to be a, a, a tough market. But for uh, new companies, for companies that are working really well, they're going to have significantly less competition, um, and that will be a, a clearer field for them them to play in. Uh, and so that means that they could, uh, and, and some of them should, uh, see faster growth and see higher margins uh, with less competition in the market, depending on what they're doing. I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I think the answer is always it depends um, for different stage, different region, and different vertical. Um, compared to in 2020 during COVID, I remember looking at a lot of the uh, YC companies or 500 global companies at that time during COVID, um, valuation was anywhere between 10 to between 10 to 20. Right now, despite the fact that it seems like there's a slowdown, valuation is anywhere between 15 to 25. So early stage, a particular if you add anything with a generative AI to it, it will automatically increase valuation anywhere from 1.5x to maybe sometimes 10x. And that's absolutely true for, for some of the more um, large language models, sort of things as stability AI, open AI, or entropic. Valuation of the first round, I think with uh, stability 
um, the first round was a hundred. It was they raised a hundred million. Um, it's just it's just crazy. So and then also what I'm seeing is um, in Asia, I think China finally opened up. And for the longest time, a lot of the investors internationally are quite risk off uh, towards Chinese companies. And many of them uh, depends on, again, what they do also have moved to Singapore. So it, now things are opening up. I do think this is actually a good thing uh, for Asia because now we can freely travel. So, so, and then having said that, I do think that later stage, um, you, and as you mentioned at the very beginning, um, there's definitely a down round. And you know, Stripe recently raised quite a few billion, and but they dropped one third uh, in value. Originally, it was I think ninety five billion, and now in, in the fifty some range. So if you're doing much later stage, um, and you know, as you said, if when there's risk and opportunities, this may be actually the time to go in because valuation for a certain stage are much more reasonable now compared to twenty twenty one. So it's something to think about. Yeah, I would, again, look on the bright side and be optimistic about it. I mean, from a venture capital perspective, some of the best companies get founded during downturns. I mean, in the last cycle, Square, Uber, Airbnb, you know, great public companies now were founded during the last, the beginning of the last downturn. And I'm here for it. I mean, that's a very interesting perspective right now is that prices have gone down, valuations have gone down. The really serious teams are surviving and, you know, they're out there both looking for capital and it's a it's a better labor market now for them. I mean, they're able to hire from the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons. There's been, you know, 330,000 layoffs in the tech industry alone. And that's helping to free up the labor market for startups, too, where you can compete now and hire some of those engineers that you normally couldn't hire before. And I think somebody mentioned AI. I think it's a really interesting space right now. And I know we're probably gonna talk about this, but I, I think people are underestimating how revolutionary it's gonna be for, for the space and for the venture capital space and startup space. Yeah, thank you. Um, I definitely hear more uh, optimism than pessimism in uh, in all your statements. And I think as a fellow venture investor, uh, you almost have to be inherent optimistic to be in venture, right? Um, I do want to drill down into AI uh, because that's just the, uh, the chat of the town. Um, I read the statistic that any company that raised funding um, with AI in the title has accounted for 20% of investment in Q1 this year. So, and I want to bring up another industry. Do you think that AI is the new blockchain? Is AI now the future? Is blockchain here to stay? Uh, maybe I can jump in and take this one too. I think it's a very, two very different industry. Um, it may seem like now all of a sudden Gen AI is the, the new hot crypto. But the reality, I think that the reason why it's driving so much buzz, unlike, unlike Web3 or crypto, open AI really shaped the core of, of Google. I, I didn't think that in my lifetime, Microsoft is going to have a comeback and, and be able to challenge using, you know, combining open AI for Bing. It's a very, very exciting, exciting time. And to the point where, there are startups now literally is changing a company which value at $1.3 trillion, this is Alphabet, on how they're going to go forward with their product. This is mind blowing. So that's why it's able to command such a high valuation and so many developers are jumping into this bandwagon, Not let alone, as I mentioned earlier, with large language model, it took years to get to this point. Now it's taking days um, to it, it literally like co-pilot for everything and code is generating code. So I think that we're not only going to 10X many of our engineers, we're going to 100X their productivity, uh, productivities for each of the engineers. Very, very exciting time to be. I think Web3 serve a very different audience. In fact, I think with all the regulatory downturn, it's driving a lot of the degen 
um, to the other extreme because seems the U.S. regulatory is not as friendly, which is driving a lot of the talent like to outside the U.S., like Hong Kong and Singapore and Dubai. So it's really interesting growth that one is gravitated towards Silicon Valley and, and the U.S. The other way, the other industry is going away from the U.S. It's just fascinating to speak. I um, am fascinated by AI as well. And I think things are changing so fast, it's almost hard to keep up with. I mean, just this week, um, I think over the weekend, there was uh, an AI generated song from that that somebody cooked up with Drake's voice and The Weeknd's voice. And it was, I think quickly, I streamed like 600,000 times on Spotify, uploaded to YouTube, all across Twitter, and um, before it was taken down. But I sent it to my internal music group at UTA. And, you know, we represent some of the best artists in the world and some of the best musicians, um, you know, Post Malone, uh, Halsey, um, Jonas Brothers, and uh, Bad Bunny. And, and they said, wow, this is not bad. This is actually really surprisingly good. And it, it, it surprised, I think, everyone. And if you just do some quick Google searches on YouTube, you can start finding all of these AI-generated songs. There's a whole Kanye West um, number of, of covers where Kanye didn't sing them. Kanye didn't do any of them, but you know Kanye has covers of Adele singing Hello, for instance, and it sounds like Kanye. It's, um, it's pretty crazy. And I think across all creative, you know, from games to art to movies, TV, script writing, and music, there's going to be a lot of change, a lot of revolution. And, you know, I, I think we as venture capital investors and kind of at that tip of the spear have to be following that. It's, it's almost hard to keep up with though, that it's happening so fast. Yeah, thank you, Clinton. I um, recently went to a seminar about AI and similar to what you said, um, someone played a song that is made by human and some other songs made by AI and audience couldn't really tell the difference. It's amazing and also scary at the same time. Um, I actually wanted mm -hmm. to bring up a question that is by the audience. So given the recent uh, instance by FTX and also Theranos in the past. What trends do you see, if any, for VC firms to improve their due diligence process? I mean, it's a great question. And um, before I, I was at UTA VC and, and started the UTA VC fund, I was at a seed fund called Crosscut Ventures based here in LA. And even as a seed fund that was 100 or $125 million, we took diligence really seriously. And I think what happened during the last funding cycle was that deals got done so fast and they were so competitive that I think diligence went by the wayside. And I think, you know, the, the FTX um, meltdown and scandal really, I think, was a reminder that it still has to happen. People still have to do their diligence. Um, especially when you're raising that kind of capital that fast. Theranos is a whole nother matter. I don't even know if Theranos ever actually raised from venture capital investors or from Silicon Valley investors. It was mostly, I think, private high net worth individuals who, who put in on, on Theranos. I don't know too many VCs that actually did that with the exception of maybe a few um, you know, private GPs who invested in that. FTX, on the other hand, it had Sequoia, you know, it had some of the best VCs around, and it was a pretty big black mark and a pretty big embarrassment, I think, for a lot of investors. I, for this, I think there's a few, although I don't know if it's tra trends yet. Um, I think all of these VCs did due diligence when they go, go into the actual investing itself, but it's really about like ongoing monitoring. And as they are operating, I don't, it's not often that we will actually go to the field to try out the product and try to understand, like, as, unless you sit on the board, but even though you're sitting on a board, you may or may not know what is the operating practice 
on an ongoing basis. I think this is definitely a wake up call for many, many venture capitalists on how do you make sure that the ongoing monetary, you're actually doing enough um, to monitor your existing portfolio are doing what they're supposed to do. And more importantly, are they just telling you what you want to hear? This is something that is very, very difficult um, to catch. So I think for, for Web3 and crypto, a lot of these activities are on chain. Um, there are now a new type of company where it's basically doing more and more data analysis and to catch uh, things like chain analysis, to catch any suspicious activities that are going in and out in certain wallets, to try to spot patterns and see what's going on. Um, you could do that with Web3, but I really wouldn't know how you would do that for healthcare, uh, for other type of companies. It's just, it's, it's, it's a tough question to answer. Yeah, thank you, uh, Iris. I, I wonder whether in the future there will be an AI detecting uh, uh, peach fraud or <laughs> something. Um, joke aside, um, other than due diligence, in this new environment, what are the biggest challenges that you face as a venture investor running a venture fund? Is it fundraising? Uh, is it exiting existing portfolio or going forward as be more picky about opportunities you're looking at? We, we, um, we finished fundraising uh, last year, so you know, pretty lucky on the timing. Uh, I've heard from a lot of friends who are in market now that it's been uh, a lot tougher uh, than any time in the last you know, five to 10 years. Uh, and if interest rates stay high, um, shifts to other asset classes, I think will make it even more difficult. There's also something called the denominator effect where a lot of institutional LPs are overexposed to venture capital as an asset class, um, that that could be a problem. Um, seeing write downs uh, could also, I think, cause some folks to be uh, a bit cautious in allocating. I think that creates opportunity uh, for LPs and GPs who are able to allocate and raise VC, as I said earlier, in terms of the, the market being less competitive and valuations being lower. Um, historically, if you look at the 80s, um, you, you saw a similar pattern in terms of interest rates, uh, pullback from venture, uh, and then you saw incredible uh, uh, vintages, uh, the same thing. Uh, around the dot-com time, the same thing around the, the financial crisis. Um, so I think I think it's you know a, a bright future ahead, but it's definitely a, a tough time for for fundraising. Uh, the same is true, I think, on the on the exits. Um, you know, we had uh, I think five public exits in 2021, uh, and you know everyone that I know who's been in market for a while had similar results in terms of exits in 2020 and in 2021. Um, that market has significantly cooled. It's not just SPACs, obviously, but also IPOs. Uh, the volume is way down. M&A volume is way down. Um, so I think for, for most folks, the, the question is, you know, are you making new investments? Are you being aggressive uh, in the face of a market that is uh, uh, more reasonable, slower moving, better valuations, less competitive? Or are you tending to your portfolio to make sure that those companies uh, survive and and can do the best that they can do. Um, balancing those two things in the overall market and the paradigm that we have right now is probably the most difficult question facing GPs. Um, we have a pretty small portfolio since we're we're young and new, so we're able to focus more on on new investments. Um, but also, obviously, just want to make sure that we're doing uh, as much as we can to support our existing investments. Thank you. Um... I would like to bring up one of the questions from the audience, uh, which is a very relevant one. What industries, services, or metric are venture investors looking for now in this more cautious time? And how can a seed stage non-AI company be attractive? I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at that, unless anyone else wants to. Um, I, I think you, know, you have to think more specifically about that. Um, so VCs are are not all the same, right? They're very, very different. Um, some VCs focus exclusively on healthcare or fintech. Some focus exclusively on enterprise SaaS. So you need to do the work to figure out if you're a founder, uh, which VCs are a fit for you. 
Uh, from there, there are definitely certain metrics that VCs look for, um, and they're not just uh, threshold numbers. You know, a magic number that people often throw out is a million uh, in annualized revenue or 100K in monthly recurring revenue. Um, and what I always tell founders is like, that's more of a heuristic than a metric. And what I mean by that is there are many companies that have raised their seed round or their series A round without having that benchmark metric achieved. And there are many companies who had way more than that uh, in terms of revenue or recurring revenue and did not raise a round. Um, and it's a much more complex picture. So I'll give you a little bit of a, a framework around that, but you have to um, kind of go layers deeper than just what is that uh, top line metric? So things that investors really like to see are a large market. They wanna see that you can actually achieve uh, a massive outcome given the loss ratio that most VCs typically have. They wanna see that you can grow very quickly. If you can build a business to scale, but it's gonna take 20, 30 years versus five to 10 years, that's a very different picture. So how are you gonna accelerate uh, your growth? They wanna see that you have some defensibility. If you're chasing the same thing as everyone else because you have a GPT uh, powered bot um, that can do you know, some basic text generation off of uh, a fixed body of, uh, of text that's not going to be defensible uh, given that there's a thousand companies doing the same thing. So how will you be maybe not defensible today, but defensible long-term? Um, thinking about these kinds of things, I think is more important than did you reach some benchmark metric when it comes to raising around and being able to tell the story about how you're gonna take the business from where it is today to somewhere much bigger very quickly is is what people are looking for and what they're interested in hearing. Um, I absolutely agree with what Neil was saying, particularly on the market side. Um, I do want to add on a couple more things more because we do precede and see that a lot of time when we invest, there's no product. Um, and so for us, relationship does matter a lot. There are a handful of folks where within our network that we've been tracking even though we're still working in the Google, Facebook, Amazon of the world, we, we know where they are working on today and we're waiting for them to leave. So, so in some sense, there are folks that we've been tracking for a long time. The minute they decide to do something new, we're there. Uh, so it's uh, so much, it's really, really important to have the founder market fit, which is have you have relevant experience, particularly from the engineering product and sales, these three things, I found that most of our founders, they even having problems to figure it out, sort of the initial lift off with the right product market fit with customers, or, or they're having trouble hiring. If you actually have experience in that particular field, you usually wouldn't have problem trying to find the first initial three to five hire because you have worked with them with a particular field before, rather than just sort of blindly in the blind. So that to us is super important. Um, second thing I want to add really is not about buzzword pitching or sprinkle AI and, and, and then trying to get a high evaluation. It's not just a buzzword. It's really thinking about every single SaaS and B2B companies. I, I really think what, what's going on with AI is going to increase productivities for, for enterprise function. Doesn't matter your marketing, sales, customer service, legal, HR, everybody can increase efficiency. Um, so we're actually doing a, an exercise with some of our portfolio companies that we already invested is the exercise of it. Does this AI buzz matter to what you're doing? Is it possible to actually 10 X and, and increase the efficiency for some of the features that you're building? Not changing your business, go to market things exactly the same. But I think there's opportunities for a lot of B2B SaaS enterprise companies um, to accelerate like their growth and their feature efficiencies. Do you want to say anything or we got the next one? I mean, I can echo what, what Neil and what Edith said, but you know, saying something just a little different way is that, you know, as VCs, we're in the business at a very early stage of assessing founders and really spending a lot of time with them and seeing if it's people who we want to spend the next five to 10 years with. And, you know, are they there to do, and do they have the fortitude to go through the really tough times when things really suck and, you know, you, it doesn't seem like you can make payroll or you've got to like raise the next round. And, and that's, I think the thing that maybe the 
that, that, that we spend a lot of time with is, is really working with our founders really early, developing the relationship and really seeing, are they in it? Are they aligned with us? You know, do we want to really spend that time with, with this group of people and help build something? You know, we, we mostly fund at the seed and series A and at that early stage and opportunistically in growth. But, you know, we, we do that analysis every time and almost in every funding round too is, uh, is this, is this a, a, a group of people, are these founders who are in it for the long haul and uh, um, can, can really do it? So, I mean, to, to answer that question, it's, it's, a, it's not just, you know, the, the founder market pit, it's not just the big market, it's not just an amazing product or, you know, a great deck, it, it really comes down to the founder um, and, and, you know, our, our fit with that founder, I think. So, you know, we're, we're just in that business. Um, and that's part of the diligence as well, is, is spending time with that founder and, and not just doing it because there's another big fancy fund that's in on it, but because we actually have conviction in that, in that person. Yeah, and there's no, no uh, investor GPT can replace that. <laughs> yeah. I don't think AI is going to replace that. Um, you might be able to leverage AI as tools <laughs> to assess the startup, to assess the market, to maybe even, you know, assess the background or, you know, whether that person has the right stuff in some ways. But the qualitative assessment is something that I think is, is, is we're, we're, we're going to have that, that. That's part of our job. It's a tough part of the job, too. Thank you. Um, thank you, Quentin. Um, I know that delving in today um, in our audience are out, there are a lot of audience outside US as well. So I wanted to kind of take an international spin on this question. Um, with the funding environment slowing down and economic slowing down in the US, you know, and it doubly a lot of people are raising money in, in Middle East and Asia. What do you think the slowdown in US mean for the rest of the world? Um, do you see or predict that talents would go raise outside the US or even move outside the US? Maybe I, I, I can take this one. I think most of the US funds um, are actually not equipped to do investment in Asia, not because they don't want to, um, but the running a venture funds, it's just like running a company. And without a local team that really understand the local market is very, very difficult to be able to invest, not let alone invest support and be helpful to, to your companies. So for us, we're not actively um, investing in Asia, but obviously there's many, many amazing Chinese, uh, Japanese, Korean, and many founders will come to the US. That's when you know, we open to chat with them. Um, I think historically, if you look at you know, funds like Sequoia or GGV uh, or Kotu or Tiger, those are the ones that have very, very strong local teams um, in, in China or Southeast Asia to really build out. And even their fund structure are very independent from each other uh, versus, let's say, Andres and Horowitz. They're huge with billions and billions of uh, AUM, but still they don't have a team in Asia. Uh, not not really actively invest in that. So it's really about the fund mandate and so the the we like the framework of how the fund is being structured. Um, it's not just about going to Asia and start investing. Um, it's really about longer term being able to support them too. Yeah, and, I, uh, oh, I was going to just say I, I agree with Edith. That's all. <laughs> um. On the international side, a little bit more specific, also I saw the question from the audience, specific on China-US relationship. Um, do you think the political risk impact uh, US fund looking at China or Chinese fund looking at US, vice versa? Just general comments about opportunities in China. I know that, it is you mentioned in the beginning, that China is now finally opened up and there are a lot of opportunities there. So just in general, how do we think about China in the big picture of China-US relationship. I'm very sad about it. I'm, I am Chinese and I, were, I couldn't go home for almost three years because of the lockdown. And I have families, my parents are in Hong Kong. And 
So I think it puts a lot of people in a very tough place. And it is a, a two different parallel universe of internet is being built. Uh, there will actually Baidu already la launched Ernie, which is their version of ChatGPT. Um, and the last few times I went back uh, for the past few months, there's a lot of chatter around. They're very excited about Gen AI. The government is pushing for it. Um, seems like it's, it's a, and Hong Kong is pushing for crypto and Web3. It seems like there's a lot of excitement. And finally, there's people traveling. So um, Hong Kong and Beijing, they're, they're packed. And, and I want to go visit and, and learn. But unfortunately, I think the two countries are not mixing. Um, in 2017, 2018, I see a lot of Chinese funds, Chinese investors in Silicon Valley. Uh, when I go to YC or 500 Demo Day, half of them are Chinese visiting from Asia, wanting to invest in local companies. You don't see that anymore. And a lot of the startups that if they're being offered subsequent funding round from Chinese VCs, a lot of them are actually hesitate to take the money. So it's very unfortunate what's going on. And I think many of us are well aware of it, but it is something that I think we're all walking a really fine line. We used to see a lot of Chinese LPs in the ecosystem too, investing into US funds. And that has really dried up in the last few years as well. And um, direct investment from Chinese VCs or from Chinese entities into startups has also dried up. Um, and part of that is the geopolitical risk. And that saddens me too, you know, as a Chinese American and my, my wife's family is from Taiwan and I used to spend a lot of time and live in Japan. Um, I, I spent a lot of time in Asia. Um, and what we've, what we've found both at UTA and also in the VC space is um, there is a way, you know, to have capital go through Singapore or through Hong Kong or through family offices that have US um, presences. You know, that this, there, there, it, it is going to happen because I think, you know, those cross-cultural connections and borders and innovation is gonna happen. It's just not happening directly. It's happening very indirectly now and adjacently through, through other borders. Yeah, I, I agree as Chinese, I feel the same as it is. It's very sad that two countries, especially the entrepreneurs from two countries can learn so much from each other and um, really inspired by each other. So hopefully the political environment will improve and uh, maybe with the help of Asia Society, plugging a little advertisement here. Um, there is a question from the audience, I think that is particular to uh, Clinton. So there was a reference that you mentioned to Drake and Weekend AI generated song uh, become very popular. How might intellectual property law be utilized, if at all, to possibly protect UTA artists and other artists? I mean, this is a really difficult question. And, you know, I'm speaking personally and not behalf of U UTA right now. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how um, litigation and IP rights enforcement actually works with AI because AI takes large language models and big data sets, which, you know, is usually IP protected in some way, and then generates something that's not quite new, that iterates on what was created before. And so there is some kind of prior art. There is some kind of prior IP. Um, I don't know what percent is new and what percent is used. So I think it's going to get litigated. I think is the short answer. And I think we're going to see, you know, UMG, um, United Music Group, um, felt that they had enough evidence to be able to, to issue a takedown notice to YouTube and to Spotify and to all social groups. That's part of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And they were able to do that. And I think we're going to see more of that. But at the same time, there's going to be, I think, so much generation that's going to be hard to keep up with. Um, that's that's going to be the real interesting and revolutionary thing is there's going to be so much AI generated art, music, um, scripts, movies, TV, games that I don't know if our current system can actually keep up with it. And that's what I said in the beginning was 
I think it's gonna be more revolutionary than we think. Um, I'm here for it. I think it's really interesting, but um, I'm also not gonna lie, a little scared for what's gonna to happen to. And, and by the way, I am a former recovering lawyer too. So I, I respect the legal system. I respect the rule of law. I think that artists should be able to protect their copyrighted IP and materials. But at the same time, I don't think AI cares. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't know what's actually going to happen, and and I think that's one of the most interesting places to be. Is you don't know what the future is going to hold. You just know that there's a force that's unleashed, and um, you, you you were almost along for the ride. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you, Clinton. It's a really great question. Um, we talk a lot about AI. Um, and generative AI, and we talk a little about a little bit about blockchain. Are there other industries, specific industry that you see exciting opportunities right now? We're we're seeing a lot of interesting stuff uh, in material science, and some of that's coming from uh, AI and, and people using uh, computer vision and machine learning and deep learning um, robotics to run uh, experiments at broader scales and draw. Uh, much more complex insights, deeper insights from those experiments to move more rapidly towards innovation in using uh, uh, things like CRISPR to custom design uh, enzymes uh, that can produce the same materials that we're using. For example, we have a company uh, called Ruby uh, that produces textiles from carbon dioxide emissions. So, you know, if you all remember back to uh, high school or middle school biology class, Right, plants take in CO2 uh, and sunlight, they do photosynthesis, they make starches, and we use those plant starches to make many things, including textiles. Um, you can do all of those things without the plant cell by mimicking some of those enzymes and maybe make an even more efficient version of that biologic process uh, and custom design the enzymes that you want, the reaction to, to go the way you want it. Um, and so that kind of stuff, uh, I think, is, is very, very exciting. Obviously, We've seen a lot in uh, synthetic meat and, and things like that, but we're just starting to scratch the surface of what synthetic biology as a whole will look like. Um, that was very hot maybe five, six years ago. I think it's it's cooled off since to some degree, um, but the innovation has continued uh, and seems to be accelerating. So we're pretty excited about that space uh, among others. It is, sir, Quentin. Yeah, I'll go. Uh, go ahead, Edith. No, I, I, and one you'll just say, make me think about Gen AI for food. If you can all of a sudden just create new food, that would be amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, but yeah, like we, we're very boring fun because we're so focused on B2B and, and you know, developers tools and enterprise. So in general, most of the things that we look at um, a little bit more, more geeky is really so much, we treat, we treat GitHub almost the app store for developers. And we constantly testing out code. And now we don't even know if some of these developers are real people, but of course, Microsoft is not going to let them to be fake, but still it's just, yeah. And, and we're very excited about that. But I think the core thing we also look at is all around data. Um, if you have the actual data, that's the goal line. So, and that apply for all industry. So as Clinton was saying about music industry or various various different entertainment that each of these data is very very different whoever holds the key to the data is really really is the core um for all industry going forward so we care a lot about that so at utavc we invest in um creators the creator economy the future of entertainment and we also leverage and we're also long-term bullish on web3 and on blockchain and also on ai but i think we see web3 and i think we see blockchain um, and ai as like enabling tools for the creators for the future of entertainment for um you know the creative class of writers and artists and game makers and movie makers to use and that's that's really interesting to us because i think there's going to be a massive amount of innovation and creativity um, for these creators, for these entertainers in the space. Um, that, that's what's interesting to us is I think in the next, you know, 
three to five years um, being around for that revolution, um, seeing what's happening in Web3 and AI, we are a talent agency and we're also tracking talent, like engineering talent, founder talent. And there's so many smart people and so many engineers that have gone into the Web3 space, gone into AI now that granted, there's gonna be a lot of blowups. There's gonna be a lot of companies that are probably overfunded and don't work out, but some of them are gonna work out and they're gonna become really revolutionary and really interesting. That's what we're you know, in the business of, of funding and trying to find. Thank you, Clinton. This question from audience, very, very important one. How much are social impact, Asian representation and environmental sustainability a part of your investment considerations? Um, yeah, I can go. So uh, the firm's called Necessary Ventures. Uh, we say that we invest in what the world needs and we take that pretty seriously. So uh, we don't think of ourselves as impact investors. We're, we are a venture capital firm, but every company we're investing in has some authentic, articulable mission about why what it's doing is good for the world. And that's something that we screen for uh, and really focus on because we know how to help those companies outcompete the rest of the market for talent, for capital, for attention in the form of earned media and owned media. So these specific things are inherent to our, our thesis and our strategy. Uh, and, and that includes uh, climate tech. So the environmental and sustainable aspect of that question uh, is something that's very, very important to us um, when we're looking for investment opportunities. Maybe I'll turn it around. Um, I think I think I know the, the person who, who put this question up there, Christopher. And um, I think we would never invest in something that had negative social impact, had negative Asian representation, had negative planetary environmental sustainability. We just wouldn't do that. It, it's, but we don't actively go out and try and be an impact investor or try and look for Asian representation or try and look for planetary environmental sustainability startups. Um, but we wanna be good stewards of capital and we don't wanna invest in things that are gonna make the world a worse place. Um, that's just not, it's not part of our business. And as allocators of capital, we just don't think it's responsible to do that. Um, I do add to one thing, and I don't know if it's social impact or not, because I don't want female founders as a, but as a social impact. But having said that, I am, we have about 15% of our companies that have a women founder today, and we want to increase that number. Uh, that is something that we deliberately are doing more and more, um, and, and I'm, we, I actually hosted a, a women CEO uh, meetup last week. It's really women female founders need to support each other and create our own club. So we're doing more and more of that. Thank you, Edith. Definitely support of that. Uh, we certainly have a lot of questions, but I'll pick one <laughs> because we're almost top of our time. What are the skills? needed to be a successful VC of the future and next era of startups? And how can a newcomer break into this industry becoming a VC like you? I, I think having a spiky kind of um, interest in an area like AI or Web3 or um, material science is, is a really interesting way. I, I got into VC by having a spiky interest and background by being COO of an international games company called Square Enix. And we did Final Fantasy and Hitman and Tomb Raider. Um, and I knew games really well. But I leveraged that to, to really encompass entertainment, creators, um, you know, future of media, future of entertainment. Um, that, that, that worked for me, but you, you kind of have to find your own way in or, or you know, climb up a ladder and break a window and find your way in. <laughs> um, thank you, Clinton. One last question. Uh, we still have a question from the audience, but one last question because we're at top of the hour. Uh, quick sentence, uh, advice to startup founders in this kind of new environment. What should they do facing kind of the long um, VC winter, funding winter coming up? 
I, I think you want to be more conservative, obviously, in, in preserving your runway uh, and spend as much time as you can with your customers, making sure you're building something that they need, that they will pay for, uh, because everything will stem from that. If you do that, you can find a way to be successful. If you don't, you won't. Yeah, we're giving advice to all of our startups to have for like 18 to 24 months of runway or even infinite runway just to be as cost conscious as possible to you know cut burn as much as possible to raise opportunistically um that that's the advice that we're giving so it's you know the, the era of zero interest rates and raising every six months is pretty much over it, it's just not going to happen anymore the cost of capital is much higher um there's just just not you know free spending and check writing as much as it has happened in the past two three years yeah, and if you have, if you are a founder, you have less than six months of runway. It's already too late. Yep. And most of our founders, if if they're at about one year, they start they start to basically figure out fundraising plan or cut costs. So it's it's good to and also making sure you have the right bank but with that risk management, and you don't you can't have only plan A and B. You need C D E F G. Um, risk management is everything. With that, thank you so much, uh, Iris, Clinton, and Neil for joining us for this very uh, timely discussion.